But there were three areas of application that Koresh worked in, and he had two different partners, or actually three different partners. He had Eli Lilly uh, on medical products, and he had a series of, of patents there. He had DuPont uh, working on something called Lignosan, and he had a joint venture between DuPont and Bayer uh, uh, that was called Bayer Semisan, or sometimes Dubay. Uh, and these were three very parallel developments, all with a clear path back to World War I and the Chemical Warfare Service, all using varying uh, compounds of ethyl mercury. Uh, and they did three different things. In agriculture, the seed disinfectant was a dust. He, he, he took ethyl mercury chloride and sometimes a phosphate, uh, formulated in such a way that you could uh, make it into a dust and you'd put seeds in it and you'd roll the seeds around in the dust and that would prevent uh, fungal overgrowth of the seeds. The seeds would germinate more effectively, and that was one application. Uh, another application was in sawmills, where you would uh, take uh, trees, take, take logs, you put them through a sawmill to, to convert them into lumber, and if you put the green lumber out, uh, fungus would grow on the lumber and discolor it, and it would be called sap stain, or sometimes blue stain, it would literally turn blue. And that wasn't good for sales, and so they would literally dip the lumber in vats of ethyl mercury, uh, and they called it lignosan. Lignin is the glue in, in pine trees. Uh, and in southern Mississippi uh, and, and Louisiana, in the southern pine belt, uh, those were the first uh, sawmill trials where they, where they used uh, this, this product. And then around the same time, uh, ethyl mercury thiosalicylate, which is this, uh, we now know as thimerosal, uh, was first developed for use as a preservative in medical products. And this uh, uh, it's, was used in blood products and gamma globulin, but the first really widespread use, commercial application for it, was the preservation of diphtheria toxoid vaccines, uh, which were developed in the late 20s. Uh, and and uh, thimerosal was, was first included, the first mention that we can find of thimerosal being used in these vaccine products was in 1931. So there were three, really three different vectors uh, that, that we think are you know, important uh, changes in the environment that occurred right before Leo Connor saw these cases. Now, Dan mentioned the, the history of these cases, and, and, and one of the things that we both did was to read Connor's original paper. And if you read his paper, it's really a, a short account up front of, of really a paragraph saying I found something new, and then a, a lengthy set, series of case histories, about 11 cases. And they are identified by a first name and a last initial. Uh, there's a fair bit of detail, uh, in particular their birth dates, but also the occupations of the fathers and the mothers, with mostly an intent to provide kind of a psychological home narrative. This is what the parents did, this is what home was like, this is what the child was doing. Um, but the interesting data, and this is how I started looking at this. I was looking for data. Uh, if you look down the birth dates, you can see the oldest child here was born uh, in 1931. And every other case was born subsequent to that. Donald T, uh, that Dan showed you, was actually born in 1933. And when he was five years old, that's when his parents brought him up to Hopkins. Uh, but you look through here, and not a single case was born before 1931, which has an interesting you know, correlation with the timing of these, commercial, these new commercial applications of ethyl mercury. Um, again, no proof, but, but certainly consistent with, with the theory of exposure. But what was interesting to us is you look down this list and, you know, occupational exposures sort of make sense. There's a lot of medical uh, professionals in here, a mining engineer, some, you know, but, but there's not anything bright or obvious that just jumps off the page. So we decided, um, and actually Dan, this was Dan's inspiration, he started reading these case histories as mystery novels. You know, could we find the clues here? Uh, Dan loves Columbo, and so you know, we were in our <laughs> Columbo mode. And, uh, and, and the thing that we started doing was using the clues in the case histories to actually find the families themselves. Uh, the first one uh, that Dan found was Donald Triplett, uh, case number one, who lives in Forest, Mississippi. We'll, we'll come back to him. But case number two was particularly interesting. And this is um, the father in case number two, the plant pathologist. As, as you can see, uh, he's here 
pictured in a photo in his archives looking at a plant. Uh, Frederick Lovejoy Wellman spent his life studying plants and, and working on uh, the prevention of fungal diseases in plants. And in the course of that, he worked with fungicides. And you, the more you learn about them, the more you realize, and he has a lengthy uh, uh, resume that describes all his expertise and all the background he has, and it goes into detailed uh, discussion of all the fungicides he's worked with, including uh, all the organic mercurials and, and many other fungicides in all kinds of plants that you could possibly imagine. So this is a man who's literally, you know, going to work and dipping uh, plants and seeds in any fungicide he can find, including all the mercury fungicides. The most fascinating thing, however, is when you, uh, you go to his, and you can find this on, on his, uh, in the archives at North Carolina State University, if you Google his name and one of the trade names, Sirisan, uh, you instantly find that uh, in his archives, he has a pamphlet uh, for this ethyl mercury fungicide product, this fungicide dust uh, that was commercial, invented by Morris Karash and commercialized by DuPont and Bayer. And you can imagine, and again, this is speculation, but imagine uh, coming home, and this is his wife, Dora, who, was, uh, who had no particular occupational exposure, but if Frederick Wellman was working with fungicide dusts, the dust would be on his clothes, he would be inhaling the vapors, and he comes home and says, hi, honey, how are you? And, and they were, by all accounts, very devoted to each other, so I'm sure he would have been hugging her as he came home from the lab. Uh, you know, she would have been exposed, too. You read Ken Connor's narrative, uh, Dora, Dora Wellman had kidney trouble, which is a signature uh, sign of, of mercury poisoning. This is uh, their son, Frederick W., case two. Uh, and this is a picture that always strikes me because people talk about the large heads, the typically large heads of autistic children, and Frederick certainly had a large head and a prominent, prominent forehead. So that vector, you know, that, that was a bit of a, a light bulb to us. That said, there's a smoking gun. We have ethyl mercury in the hands and on the clothes of the father of case number two. Um, and so with Donald, with Frederick, we kept going. And over the course of, and Dan was finding these, and we were madly talking about all the connections. And, and, and over the course of a number of years, uh, we succeeded in finding the real identities of seven of the original 11 cases. Uh, the four that we don't are, are the blue shaded. But um, we have found uh, their names, uh, their occupations. We, we've been able to trace life histories of, of several of them. And uh, what's interesting is uh, you focus in on, if you learn more about their occupations, you also learn there are plausible ethyl mercury exposures. There are also plausible mercuric chloride exposures, other forms, background mercury ex exposures that are notable. And two I would mention, um, one is lab workers. Uh, people that worked in pathology labs. One of the, one of the uh, mothers, Ruth Roman, uh, mother of case number 10, was a stenographer in a pathology lab uh, before her marriage. And that, what that meant, it, it, Connor describes her as a secretary, but actually another description says she's a stenographer, which would mean literally she was, you know, uh, the doctor would be standing over the autopsy body and would be dictating uh, observations, and she would be in the lab next to him, uh, writing, writing down, uh, taking notes, and uh, and in the lab inhaling mercury vapors. Because one of the uh, uh, applications of mercury was as a tissue preservative. They would literally store autopsy tissue or experimental tissue for studies uh, in in mercuric chloride. And there, there have been subsequent studies that show that it, this was a huge occupational risk. We have a, a, a paper from 1977 showing the enormously elevated levels of mercury in the urine of pathology lab employees. And that would include research scientists, lab technicians, lab staff, and, and secretaries. So that's one vector of background exposure to mercury. Another uh, dramatic exposure to mercury was uh, anyone who was involved in syphilis treatments which would include both uh, mercuric chloride, because they were still injecting mercuric chloride in the 1930s uh, into syphilis patients. Penicillin hadn't been invented. Uh, and they would also rub 
ointments on the skin of syphilis patients that it would tend to fight the syphilis rashes. So anyone working in dermatology uh, and, and often neuropsychiatry, that's the phrase that we came across. So whether it was doctors or neuropsychiatrists or nurses, these would be general background exposure risks for mercury. And so if you think about the fungicide dusts and the lumber and the diphtheria toxoid vaccine preservative, in the context of people with a background exposure to mercury, you have at least a plausible narrative for a, a number of these cases. Um, Lee Rosenberg, Seymour Rosenberg treated syphilis patients. He wrote a, a paper on dementia paralytica, which is another name for the, the worst form of neurosyphilis. And his wife was a pathology lab stenographer. Uh, Lawrence Trevet also wrote a paper on, uh, on uh, neurosyphilis and um, uh, worked in a, in a hospital at, in, at Mass General in Boston, Harvard Medical School, where they were uh, treating, injecting patients with mercuric chloride. Uh, his wife was a pediatrician, I'll talk about her in a second. Wendell Muncy wrote in the 30s, uh, he was subsequently more of an office psychiatrist, but in the 1930s, uh, he wrote uh, lab papers. He did brain studies and was obviously working in the lab. His wife was a nurse at Hopkins. Uh, we don't know what kind of work she did. Uh, but that, um, you know, that's a plausible exposure. So our argument is there are, two, there are two clusters in here. One is the fungicide cluster. Uh, Frederick Wellman, the plant pathologist with Cirrusan, another uh, of the fathers was a forestry professor, and we know that he was working uh, in academic departments where these lignosan uh, experiments were being carried out. Uh, so. Donald Triplett, uh, grew up in Forest, Mississippi, which was right in the heart of these sawmill lignosan trials in the 1930s. And his, his parents, the son of the mayor and the daughter of the bank president, were uh, uh, built a new house in 1933 uh, with lumber from the, the town sawmill. So there's a, there's a plausible vector there for the fungicide cluster. Uh, and then there's sort of this medical group. Um, we've mentioned there's a mining engineer in there. We, don't, we haven't been able to find him. He was from Australia. His family was from Australia. Um, but there is a, there's a medical group, and all of these folks were um, at risk for background exposures and then likely to be early adopters of the diphtheria toxoid vaccine. Um, one particular parent is of interest, and that's uh, Elizabeth Peabody. And she was a pediatrician. Uh, she had the distinction of uh, she, uh, early in her career when she was newly married, she came up to Boston, she, she studied at Hopkins, she came to Harvard Medical School uh, where she got her degree. She was a pediatrician uh, and was involved in a research project which was uh, a, a, the first time where uh, a group of pediatricians decided to follow not sick children, but well children to, uh, to understand and manage normal development. And this was basically you know, the origination of what we now call the well baby visit. So she was there at the beginning, and, and, obvious, and, and part of these protocols, we know uh, definitively that diphtheria toxoid uh, uh, immunizations were a critical part of this early, uh, this early program that she was leading, and she was having her children at the same time. Um, one of whom uh, was a girl who had difficulty with language and, and behavior, uh, but suddenly seemed to emerge from that. But her, her third child, a young boy, was eventually Herbert B. Uh, or John Trevet, case number seven. Uh, this was a case where the, the name was sort of hidden uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Connor write-up because they were uh, closer colleagues at, um, at Hopkins. 